let me share the screen okay just a minute i have to share the screen just a minute it will take few seconds only okay is it visible Is the screen visible? This take up, Purna? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, we'll start. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, today's topic of our discussion is mechanism of transpiration from transpiration chapter. So, this is today's topic. Main topic is chapter transpiration. From that chapter, we are mainly focusing on the mechanism of transpiration, and in that. We're again focusing on the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. And this mechanism we are going to study with the help of Stewart's hypothesis. So we'll begin our talk with the talk on transpiration. Okay. Well, in the very previous chapters, we studied that uh, plants absorb a large amount of water with the help of their root system from the soil. And that physiological process is known as water absorption. Now, of this absorbed water, very insignificant amount, just one to two percent of the total water absorbed is being utilized by the plant itself for its metabolism. That is, the rest of the water, a huge amount, about 98 to 99 percent of water which is absorbed is lost from the plant body. It is lost from the aerial parts of the plant body. It is lost from the shoot system of the plant body by the process of transpiration. So water absorption takes place through the process of water absorption by the root system, whereas transpiration takes place by the aerial parts, leaves, by the process of transpiration. So here, we, if we want to define transpiration, we can define it as the loss of water in the form of water vapors from the aerial parts of plant body. So loss of water is important, and the loss is in the what in the form of water vapors because when there is loss of water from the plant body in the form of liquid or liquid droplets, then that process is another process. It is called as gutation, and when that liquid con consists of some organic and inorganic salts dissolved in that, uh, either due to natural or accidental uh, injury, then that process is called as exudation. These processes we are going to discuss later. But at this stage, you remember that this loss is in the form of water vapors and it occurs from the aerial parts of the plant body. The loss of water in the form of water vapors from the aerial parts of plant body. Now, this process of transpiration it is not very much different from the process of evaporation of water from the wet sponge, but it differs from the latter process, from the evaporation process, in that this transpiration is a physiological process, whereas evaporation is a physical process. Transpiration is regulated by living cells of the plant body due to some pressures, like diffusion pressure, vapor pressure, or diffusion pressure deficit, Mm, that we are going to study later on. And uh, there is one more difference between transpiration and evaporation that you, you know after evaporation, the surface becomes dry. But in case of transpiration, when there is water loss from the aerial parts, from the leaf surface or from the surface of green stain, then the transpiring surfaces become moist and wet because uh, that, is a, that is a sort of... Uh, uh, losing water to uh, resist their, uh, to protect them, to protect those organs from sun burning. So that is another difference between transpiration and evaporation. So transpiration is useful process in that sense here. And we also studied the process of transpiration is, is very important for the process of ascent of sap as well as the process of water absorption to take place. If there is no transpiration, there will, there will be 
no ascent of sap. If there is no transpiration, there will be no water absorption, passive method. We studied that. So transpiration is useful process there. It is advantageous to the plant in one hand. In, on the other hand, it is also disadvantageous because there is a huge loss of water, tremendous amount of water is lost from the plant body and it, it becomes problem specifically or especially in the places where there is scarcity of water. So in one hand, transpiration is useful process. In other hand, it is uh, disadvantageous. It is having demerits. And that is the reason why transpiration is popularly called as a necessary evil. Okay. Now on the basis of uh, which aerial parts of the plant, actually all aerial parts of the plant body show the phenomenon of transpiration, but the main transpiring organ is leaf. And therefore that type of transpiration is called as transpiration through leaf is called as foliar transpiration, which takes place mainly through the stomata. And therefore it is the main type of transpiration known as stomatal transpiration. But some other parts are also involved uh, through which transpiration takes place and on the basis of which part of the plant body is involved in the process of transpiration, there are different types of transpiration like stomatal transpiration or foliar transpiration, which consists of uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the total transpiration occurring through this mechanism, whereas cuticular transpiration, just uh, 10 to 20 percent of water is lost through the cuticle and lenticular transpiration accounts for just 0.1%. So it is a negligible type of transpiration. So the main transpiration type is stomatal transpiration or foliar transpiration, which occurs through the minute openings which are present, microscopic openings which are present on the surface of uh, green leaves as well as uh, green herbaceous stem. And uh, actually these uh, stomata are meant for gases exchange, but through the same pores, through the same stomata, Water vapors are also released outside the plant body. So that type of transpiration is the main, is called as stomatal or foliar transpiration. Whereas the second type, cuticular transpiration, you know, cuticle is a sort of waxy layer made up of chemical substance cutein. Uh, and that uh, cutein is, uh, uh, it is resistant to water. So cuticle is actually meant for resisting transpiration. You must uh, have noted that the plants which are growing in sunlight they are having very thick cuticle, whereas those plants which grow in the shade condition, they are having thin cuticle because cuticle is meant to resist transpiration. But sometimes it becomes permeable to water loss due to some cracks in it. And when that happens, when the water vapors are released through cuticle, then that type is called as cuticular transpiration. Whereas the uh, lenticular transpiration is the one which occurs through lenticels. These lenticels are special type of cells, slate-like structures which are present on the bark of woody stem. And these cells consist of some complementary cells which uh, provides, and th these are the portion of dead tissue of the plant body, but they provide uh, the means for uh, giving aeration to the inner living parts of the plant body. And these structures are called as lenticels. And when water is lost from lenticels, and then that method is called as lenticular or lenticular transpiration, which is but a negligible type of transpiration. So there are three ty types of transpiration of which stomatal transpiration or foliar transpiration is the main type of transpiration. So before studying this stomatal transpiration, we need to understand the structure of stomata. You know, stomata are microscopic openings or pores which are present both on the upper and lower epidermis of leaves and green herbaceous stems. And these are meant for gases exchange and through these pores transpiration takes place. Each stomata, you can see here, each stomata consists of two specialized epidermal cells and these cells are called as guard cells. These guard cells are kidney shaped or bean shaped in case of dicot leaves, whereas the guard cells are dumbbell shaped in case of monocot leaves. These are specialized cells in the sense they are, uh, you see, we will discuss that. Uh, these uh, guard cells are again surrounded by uh, some unspecialized epidermal cells and these are called as subsidiary cells and these guard cells consist of nucleus you can see that it, these are green cells these are living cells they consist of many cytoplasmic organelles chloroplast is also present so that is the main portion of the guard cells then uh, uh, these guard cells are having layer or wall which is double layered or double wall that is having outer wall as well as inner wall the specificity of the their wall is that the outer walls are 
thin and elastic. Outer walls of guard cells are thin and elastic, whereas the inner walls are thick and non-elastic. And these inner walls are present surrounding the central cavity of the guard cells, which is called as the stomium or respiratory cavity. So this is the general structure of the stomata. Now, when we want to study the mechanism of transpiration, which occurs through stomata, when water vapors are lost from the stomata, it is obvious that when stomata open, transpiration takes place. When stomata are closed, transpiration is absent. So for understanding the mechanism of transpiration, we need to understand the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata, how stomata become open and how they become closed. And this movement of stomata is called as stomatal movement. It is also called as diurnal movement of stomata because uh, it happens during day and night time. It is a well-known fact today that stomata are usually, or in most of the plants, stomata are open during daytime and they are closed during nighttime. In darkness, they are closed. In light, they are open. And that behavior is called as diurnal behavior of stomata or it is called as stomatal movement. And in this process of mechanism of opening and closing of stomata, guard cells play a very important role vital role, a living role, physiological role in the process, and specifically the difference in the wall thickness of guard cells. Just now we, uh, we have seen that outer wall, which is thin and elastic, inner wall, which is thin, thick and non-elastic. So this difference in the wall thickness of guard cells also play an important role in the process of opening and closing of stomata. And ultimately that results in the changes in the turgidity of guard cells. Now, how it happens, we are going to discuss it later on in the next few slides. We are going to see that, and that is very interesting mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. But at this moment, you just uh, uh, try to understand that difference in the wall thickness is important, and changes in the turgidity of guard cells is also an important factor uh, regarding the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. Different hypotheses or different theories for explaining the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata have been proposed by different scientists from time to time, and this can be considered as photosynthesis hypothesis, starch sugar interconversion hypothesis, Stewart's hypothesis, and potassium pump theory proposed by scientist Lee White in 1974. So we're going to discuss these hypotheses. So photosynthesis hypothesis and starch sugar interconversion hypothesis, these are the basic uh, hypotheses which explain the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata, that is how stomata become open during daytime and how it is closed during nighttime. That we're going to discuss in some of the coming slides. So listen carefully here, how opening of stomata takes place. Now see what happens during daytime. Now, according to some scientists during daytime, as guard cells are living cells, they are green cells, they are photosynthetic cells. So they photosynthesize with the help of their chloroplast they prepare food material in the form of sugar. And as the sugar is soluble, it is dissolved in the cell sap of guard cells. According to some other scientists, starch, which is present during night time, it is converted into sugar during daytime. But whatever may be the case, you have to understand at this stage that the sugar, which is soluble sugar, uh, it is soluble uh, compound, it gets dissolved in the cell sap of guard cell during daytime. And when it is dissolved in the cell sap, the cell sap, uh, the osmotic concentration or diffusion pressure deficit of guard cells, cell sap increases. It becomes more than that of the surrounding cells or subsidiary cells. So subsidiary cells become hypertonic, uh, uh, sorry, hypotonic. And these become hypertonic because their osmotic concentration increases. Osmotic concentration of the cell sap of guard cell increases, it becomes hypertonic due to, uh, due to dissolvement of sugar in uh, cell sap. So when the osmotic concentration of cell sap of guard cell increases as compared to the neighboring or surrounding subsidiary cell, we have studied the process of osmosis takes place when the two solutions of different concentration are separated from each other by means of semi-permeable membrane, there is movement of water, from its region of higher concentration to region of lower concentration. So when the osmotic pressure of guard cell cells have increases, it absorbs water 
from the surrounding uh, accessory cell by the process of osmosis and that inward movement of water inside the guard cell is called as endosmosis. So when endosmosis takes place continuously, there is increase in the turgidity of guard cells. Guard cells become turgid and they develop a sort of pressure that is created by the cell cytoplasm on the cell wall of guard cell and that pressure is called as turgor pressure. So turgor pressure increases due to turgidity, TP, turgor pressure of guard cell increases and when there is pressure on the cell wall of guard cell, ultimately what happens? The outer cell wall, which is thin and elastic, it gets stretched away uh, from the central cavity due to increase in turgor pressure. And as the outer walls are also attached to the inner wall, at the same time, they also try to pull away the inner walls. But as you know, inner walls are thick and non-elastic Therefore, they just become concave at the place like this and the space surrounding the central cavity becomes widened and therefore the stomata becomes open. So uh, what happens? During daytime, sugar is soluble. It increases the osmotic concentration of guard cell. When osmotic concentration increases, endosmosis takes place. Cells become, guard cells become turgid. Due to turgidity, turgor pressure develops and due to turgor pressure, outer walls are stretched away and these outer walls also try to stretch, stretch the inner walls, which are but thick and non-elastic, and therefore the stomata just become concave at the place. And uh, I have shown it in animation here, opening of stomata. You can see how stomata becomes open uh, during daytime due to, uh, due to difference in the wall thickness, outer wall, inner wall, and this is the central cavity, how it is opening. See again, opening of stomata. The outer walls are stretched out, outward, inner wall becomes concave at the place and the central cavity or stromium becomes open during daytime and when stomata becomes open, there is process of transpiration, okay. Now what happens during nighttime or in darkness, how stomata becomes closed during nighttime? The reverse thing happens, you see. Uh, during night time, whatever sugar is synthesized during daytime, it is converted into starch. And you know, starch is a polysaccharide, it is insoluble sugar, it is insoluble compound. So the osmotic concentration or osmotic pressure of guard cell decreases. Diffusion pressure deficit of guard cell decreases. And when it decreases, it loses water to the surrounding, surrounding accessory cell or subsidiary cell by the process of osmosis. And this outward movement of water from the guard cells to the subsidiary cells is known as exosmosis. When exosmosis occur, the guard cells become placid, they become plasmalized. And when they, they become placid, when they are contracted, their turgor pressure decreases. And when their turgor pressure decreases, the outer wall as well as inner walls come close together and therefore the central cavity which was wide open, now it is closed. This happens during nighttime. So this is the basic mechanism. And during daytime, there is a sugar which is soluble. During the nighttime, there is starch which is insoluble. And therefore this hypothesis is called as starch-sugar interconversion hypothesis. Starch-sugar interconversion hypothesis. That is starch is converted into sugar during daytime. Sugar is converted into starch during night times due to presence of starch in the guard cell during night time, the osmotic pressure decreases, exosmosis occurs, guard cells become placid, turgor pressure decreases, and stomata becomes closed during night time. So this is the mechanism. Try to see how the walls are coming close together. You can see here, outer, outer walls as well as inner walls are coming close together due to the flaccidity of guard cells and the cells have become placid due to exosmosis and exosmosis takes place due to loss of water from guard cells into subsidiary cells and this has happened due to presence of starch inside the guard cells during night time. So this is the basic mechanism of opening and closing of stomata during daytime and night time. Now these are, this, this is uh, some of the historical developments in the field of mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. Now see, you see, uh, today everyone knows that uh, stomata are open during daytime and they are closed during night time. But it was the scientist Von Moll in 1856 who observed for the first time 
that stomata are open during daytime and they are closed during night time and according to him this happens due to presence of light light is the factor which is responsible for this method because light when present during daytime it uh, it causes photosynthesis it forms sugar but that hypothesis was later um, rejected by two scientists lloyd in 1908 lord field in 1921 uh, who proposed starch sugar interconversion hypothesis which we have just now studied how starch is converted into sugar and sugar is converted into starch then scientist seri in 1926 proposed that not the light but ph is the factor which is responsible for this starch sugar conversion but how ph is responsible for this starch sugar interconversion it was not explained by scientist seri in 1926 but later on in 1932 scientist scarth gave that explanation that how ph is responsible for starch sugar interconversion seri said that basic ph favors formation of sugar whereas acidic ph favors formation of starch but how it happens how ph is responsible for the starch sugar interconversion it was explained nicely by scientist karth in 1932 what was his explanation try to understand you know uh, during night time uh, you, you, you have studied in your lower classes that it is not proper to sleep beneath the tree uh, during night time because uh, during night time trees uh, release carbon dioxide so and during day time they release oxygen uh, so that is the fact but it is uh, not directly like that respiration that is the intake of oxygen and release of carbon dioxide it is 24 hour process it is 24 hour process it 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 it, it is uh, going on during day time as well as night time that is intake of oxygen and release of carbon dioxide but what happens during night time is that uh that carbon dioxide during day time it is taken up immediately by plant for the process of photosynthesis so carbon dioxide is not accumulated in the vicinity of plant during day time and but during night time what happens as there is absence of photosynthesis due to absence of light during night time whatever carbon dioxide is released through respiration it is uh, not used it is not utilized for photosynthesis so that carbon dioxide gets accumulated inside the water which is present in the gut cells so when co2 combines with h2o it forms h2co3 that is carbonic acid a weak acid and as it is a weak acid it gets easily dissociated into h plus and co3 minus ions that is protons anions and cations so there is continuous process of carbonic acid formation there is formation of continuously h plus ion concentration increases and when h plus ion concentration increases it means ph value decreases because we know ph is minus log of h plus ion concentration ph value decreases during night time means it becomes less than 7 that means it becomes acidic and when the ph is acidic it favors formation of starch from the sugar it was the explanation given by scar and what happens during day time as there is process of photosynthesis during day time whatever carbon dioxide is released through the process of respiration it is immediately utilized by gut cells or all cells of the plant body so there is shortage of uh, carbon dioxide and there is no formation of carbonic acid so hydrogen ion concentration decreases and hydrogen ion concentration decreases means ph value increases and ph value increases means it becomes either neutral or it becomes more than 7 it becomes alkaline ph basic ph and this basic ph favors conversion of starch into sugar during day time so this is the explanation that was given by scientist scarth in 1932 during the process actually there is not direct conversion of starch into sugar but starch is converted into glucose one phosphate and this reaction is catalyzed by enzyme phosphorylase this process is called as phosphorylation addition of phosphate group and this was the discovery by scientist hens in 1940 uh, enzyme phosphorylase was discovered by scientist hence in 1940 and later on in 1948 two japanese scientists in and tung they isolated this enzyme phosphorylase in crystalline form and after 1948 in 1964 steward proposed his famous hypothesis according to whom inorganic phosphate and glucose 1 phosphate are 
osmotically equally active we are going to discuss this but at this stage you just remember that if the inorganic if the osmotic concentration of inorganic phosphate is 10 unit then glucose 1 phosphate if it's osmotic concentration uh, i mean if it is 10 unit it is also having 10 unit osmotic concentration so together their osmotic concentration becomes 20 units osmotic concentration of inorganic phosphate you suppose for, for the purpose of convenience you take it as 10 unit then it will also become 10 unit. if it is 20 it, it will be 20 so that the total will be 40 units so inorganic phosphate and glucose 1 phosphate are osmotically equally active this is the main contribution of stewards in this all historical development proposed for explaining the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata and after stewards in 1974 there came another scientist called as levite and that theory is called as potassium pump theory that we are going to discuss later on now we are going to focus on the stewards hypothesis proposed by scientist stewards in 1964 so see according to stewart what, what happens see according to him uh, during daytime starch is converted into glucose 1 phosphate so this is actually uh, the reaction which is catalyzed by enzyme phosphorylase you can see here enzyme this reaction is called as phosphorylation that is addition of phosphate group you can see here so phosphate group is added in the glucose at the first carbon position uh, so here is inorganic phosphate that inorganic phosphate uh, is the source of this phosphate group so during uh, daytime starch is converted into glucose 1 phosphate with the help of enzyme phosphorylase now this glucose 1 phosphate is converted into another compound that is called as glucose 6 phosphate and this reaction is catalyzed by another enzyme called as phosphoglucomutase as you can see here this is phosphoglucomutase and this type of enzyme is called as transferase because this enzyme catalyzes just the transfer of phosphate group from the first carbon position to the sixth carbon position of uh, glucose molecules so here starch is converted into glucose 1 phosphate n number of molecules of glucose 1 phosphate are formed because the starch is a polysaccharide this is a monosaccharide then glucose 1 phosphate is converted into glucose 6 phosphate then glucose 6 phosphate dissociate it is hydrolyzed into glucose you can see here glucose and inorganic phosphate glucose is released and inorganic phosphate is also released see what happens so according to the earlier scientist glucose is glucose is responsible for increasing the osmotic concentration of car cells but now stewards said that glucose the osmotic concentration of glucose and osmotic concentration of inorganic phosphate is equal and as inorganic phosphate was already there during night time so suppose it is having 10 unit osmotic concentration it was there inside the guard cell during night time but it has not increased the osmotic concentration of guard cell because it was not sufficient uh, for the process of endosmosis but when the by this process starch is converted into glucose 1 phosphate then 6 phosphate and then glucose and inorganic phosphate you can see here now here osmotic concentration of inorganic phosphate is 10 unit and osmotic concentration of glucose is 10 unit so together their osmotic concentration becomes 20 unit during daytime and this 20 unit osmotic concentration is responsible for increasing the osmotic concentration or osmotic pressure or diffusion pressure deficit of the cell sap of guard cell and therefore by subsequent events the stomata becomes open during daytime according to scientist stewards so this enzyme uh, sorry this reaction is catalyzed by phosphatase this is hydrolysis reaction this reaction is also called as uh, you need, uh, uh, this is called as dephosphorylation reaction that is removal of phosphate group phosphate inorganic phosphate is removed so this is dephosphorylation uh, this is phosphorylation addition of phosphate is phosphorylation cause catalyzed by enzyme phosphorylase this is dephosphorylation enzyme this is hydrolysis uh, this uh, this this reaction requires water and uh, uh, it is catalyzed by phosphatase uh, enzyme now see what happened this uh, stomata becomes open due to formation of glucose and inorganic phosphate during daytime now this inorganic phosphate is released in the guard cell and uh, now he, here this inorganic phosphate is of no use now what happens see here during night time see this glucose this glucose is converted into glucose 6 phosphate 
and for this conversion it requires atp because the source of this phosphate is atp adenosine triphosphate which consists of three phosphate groups so one phosphate is added here and only two phosphate groups, groups uh, remain here and these are called as adenosine diphosphate diphosphate means two phosphate here initially there was three phosphate groups atp this is energy and this energy has come from respiration and for that process of respiration oxygen is uh, necessary this is aerobic process so this reaction is catalyzed by another enzyme and this enzyme is called as hexokinase because it uh, it, it it phosphorylates the hexo sugar six carbon hexo means six six carbon glucose uh, it 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 is it is phosphorylating glucose and that means glucose this single glucose is converted into glucose 6 phosphate uh, and this phosphate is coming from the atp atp is utilized in the process so this is the energy consuming process then glucose 6 phosphate during night time is again converted into glucose 1 phosphate so this is a reversible reaction phosphoglucomutase is, is it is responsible for interconversion of glucose 1 phosphate and glucose 6 phosphate the same enzyme is required depending on the uh, conditions whether the ph is basic or acidic it catalyzes the conversion of glucose into one glucose one phosphate into glucose six phosphate and glucose six phosphate into glucose one phosphate then what happens this glucose one phosphate is again converted into starch with the help of the same enzyme phosphorylase so this is phosphorylation reaction these all reactions are going on when the ph is acidic and when there is dark condition night condition so starch is synthesized again during night time and it is present inside the guard cell and as starch is insoluble sugar it decreases the osmotic concentration of guard cell and then by subsequent events stomata becomes closed during night time so this was the hypothesis given by stewards you get you get it this during daytime starch to glucose 1 phosphate glucose 6 phosphate glucose and inorganic phosphate which are osmotically equally active and they together increase the osmotic concentration of guard cell and then by subsequent events stomata becomes open during daytime now during, during night time this glucose is converted into glucose 6 phosphate this is phosphorylation reaction and then it is converted into one phosphate starch and again into uh, it leads to the closure of stomata when the ph is acidic when there is dark condition. This is the hypothesis proposed by scientist Stewart in 1964 for explaining the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. Now you can see here, you can compare opening of stomata and closing of stomata. Is it visible to you? See here, how the stomata becomes open. Okay, see here, how the stomata is opening, how the walls are being stretched, how the outer wall is stretched, and how it is also stretching the inner wall so that the central cavity is opening and here see how due to flaccidity the outer wall as well as inner walls are coming close together that is resulting in closure of stomata during night time or in acidic ph and this happens during daytime or when the ph of the guard cell and the surrounding uh, cells is basic this is opening of stomata this is closing of stomata when stomata are open transpiration takes place when stomata are closed, there is no transpiration. And this is the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata as per the scientist Stewart's proposed in 1964. These are some of the references. Thank you very much for patient listening to me. Okay, is it clear to you? Any questions? Any questions? Any problem? No questions. It seems no questions in the chat box. Yes. Yes, who is speaking? Mayuri, is there any problem regarding whatever we yes, have sir. discussed up till now? Yes, Pimpre, unmute yourself and speak out. Unmute, unmute. 
yourself you are muted unmute and speak ask your question so it seems there are no questions फर्स्ट कार्बन ऑफ ग्लुकोज टू दिक्स कार्बन ऑफ ग्लुकोज दैट इज ग्लुकोज सिक्स फॉस्पेट दैट वी है Okay. Any other question? No questions. So shall I wind up now? In the next lecture, we'll study another important hypothesis proposed by scientist Levite in 1974, and that is called as potassium pump hypothesis, potassium transport theory. Okay. So shall I end the meeting? Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Have a nice day.